<coughs> Let me begin with uh, an announcement. Um, uh, how many of you here have heard of uh, something called the Bhopal gas leak? Any idea? Uh, okay, a few, few, uh, just a couple of you. All right, so in 1984, that's uh, exactly 25 years ago, uh, in the city of Bhopal, which is a city in uh, central India, in the state of MP. So it's, uh, you know, if this is Delhi over here, so Bhopal would be, you know, roughly around here, okay? That's about, you know, four or five hundred kilometers, something of that kind. So there's a, uh, there was then a, uh, a Union Carbide uh, gas plant over there. And uh, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was on the night of December 2nd that there was a gas leak from that plant, which left several thousand people dead and several hundred thousand people uh, injured, uh, in some cases permanently injured. Uh, the, uh, it, it raised a huge uh, furor, but like uh, all such things, particularly if it happens in the third world, and back then in 1984, 25 years ago, India was uh, distinctly not really a part of the, if I may put it this way, a consciousness of most people here. So uh, not a country that could have exercised any kind of muscle power, because if you had had, let's say, something like that happening, uh, in the U.S., I mean, you'd have lawsuits running into the tens of billions of dollars because I, I'm really quite serious that we're talking about several thousand people killed, um, and a uh, majority of them overnight because this is poisonous gas, so it leaks from this plant. This is an American-owned plant, Union Carbide, and uh, uh, the uh, number of people who were injured severely, uh, and in some cases it took, you know, it took uh, a generation for the illnesses to come out. So women who were pregnant, uh, many of them uh, who gave birth to children, the children were born deformed. Uh, the gas had leaked into the groundwater, so the water supply of that entire city really got contaminated. Uh, and there's still studies going on. And uh, uh, if I may put it this way quite bluntly, I mean, you'll hear more about this later on uh, in class when we talk a little bit about ecological and environmental movements. Uh, but the compensation given to the people who were the victims was absolutely paltry, absolutely paltry. There was a, a class action suit uh, uh, which uh, the Supreme Court of India awarded $640 million uh, to the victims and all, but we're talking about something like close to half a million victims. So you can see that per victim, it's virtually nothing. Uh, they tried to have the court, uh, they tried to do a class action suit in the United States uh, because they knew that if a U.S. court would take up this matter, that the compensation that these people would get would be much larger. Uh, but, the, but the courts in the U.S. refused to take up the matter, saying that it was not within the jurisdiction of the United States, even though the corporation was American-owned. Okay, so, you know, there's, there's this whole tricky terrain of what international law is on these kinds of matters. Now, uh, anyhow, I bring up this matter at this point, and this is where the announcement comes in that, uh, uh, you know, you're not required to come to this. Uh, I'm going to plead with you to come to it, if you can, to block off the time. That's why I want to let you know right now. But on May 28th, which is a Thursday, so the day of your class, uh, later in the afternoon from 3 to 5, there is an international campaign to bring awareness of this because most of the people who were the victims of it still have not been handed out justice, right? Uh, and as I said, the majority of them haven't received a single cent of compensation. Um, so one of the survivors of that is going to be here uh, that day, uh, along with uh, t well, two of the survivors and two social activists, one based in the US. There's an international campaign for justice in Bhopal. That's what it's called. Uh, and one social political activist in India. And the four of them and myself uh, will be part of a panel um, to discuss this and to talk about, uh, you know, and to bring awareness of this uh, and, of course, it falls squarely within the period that we're doing. In fact, by sheer coincidence, uh, we're going to be actually talking about the ecology and environment more or less around that time. Um, so, as I said, you know, I can't uh, obviously require you to come to it uh, because it falls outside class 
hours, uh, but I'm going to really request you to and plead with you to come if you can, if you're not doing anything else. So it's three to five, and I'll give you details about that later on, which room. It's in the geology building, um, but I don't know the room number yet, uh, on Thursday, May 28th, OK? Um, so uh, now, having made that announcement, let me go back to where uh, I was on Tuesday. I had been talking to you about the Sikh separatist movement. And I think I gave you a narrative which uh, some of you might find a little uh, complex in the sense that there are many different elements in it. The elements that go back essentially to the 15th, 16th century, right? Uh, so I, I want to recapitulate what I said uh, in order to bring that narrative to a conclusion. Um, because that narrative, narrative and its conclusion tells us a lot about the history of South Asia, um, uh, India in this case, uh, in uh, modern times. Uh, and uh, touches upon all kinds of relation questions such as the, the status of what are called minorities, right? Uh, the, the relationship between culture and religion and the state. Uh, how do states uh, bring down movements? that they don't look upon sympathetically, right? I mean, in the US, really, you have never experienced anything like a secessionist movement since the Civil War. I mean, that's really the last time that in the US you could think of it. Just like the US, I mean, and in that sense, the US is really basked in, in that sense, in a kind of innocence which is really almost unheralded in world history. That is, that the kinds of experiences that most nations have gone through, the US has absolutely no inkling of it. Uh, and one of them would be, obviously, the experience of war. I mean, you know, the last time anything ever happened here uh, was the attack on Washington, D.C. in 1812 before 9-11. Uh, you know, that is, a, you know, an external enemy. Uh, and, of course, you've got Pearl Harbor, but that's not on the, you know, it's, that's not mainland United States. I mean, that was still off on an island, you know. Right, so most countries in the world have gone through these kinds of things, secession, war, and so on. Um, and I think in the U.S., there is a kind of a absolute innocence about this, you know, in that very limited sense, right? That is what, is, what is it to be at the receiving end of this, right? Not the delivering end, the receiving end of this kind of thing. So how do states, and India is a democracy, so this is why this, what's happened in the Punjab is important. How do states that are democracies, modern democracies, handle the question of secession? Uh, and I think that secession and secessionist demands are not going to disappear from South Asia at all. I mean, in fact, uh, it looks like it's going to get much worse, particularly if you take Pakistan and Afghanistan, okay, uh, into the equation now. Because what's going to be the future of Pakistan is, I think, in fact, an open question now, okay, in some respects, okay? Um, so uh, remember now what were the elements of that narrative I put into place? That here you have a religion that's founded in the 15th century, in a manner of speaking, founded in the 15th century. I mean, it doesn't have its elements coming into place until Guru Gobind Singh, remember, in 1708, right, uh, in the early 1700s, uh, when, he's, when he creates a Khalsa, you know, a brotherhood of the pure, right? Um, and I pointed out to you that right from the outset, the, the problem was, well, how do you actually define a Sikh? That's one problem, right? What distinguishes a Sikh from a Hindu, right? And I pointed out to you that, for example, in 1850s, when they are doing a kind of an informal serve, you know, census, uh, Sikhs are counted as Hindus. They're counted as Hindus. They are not distinguished. The 1888, 1881 census does actually distinguish between the two, but it doesn't define what is a Sikh, right? So do you define a Sikh? And the reason it doesn't is because obviously there's a great deal of ambivalence that Sikhs and Hindus, in fact, share a great deal in common. In fact, in the Punjab, where all of these political troubles have been taking, were taking place in the 70s and 80s, uh, in the Punjab, it was very common that in a Hindu family, if you had two children, you would bring up, especially in the rural Punjab, you would bring up the first child as a Hindu, the second child as a Sikh. Very common. Okay. Right? So we are saying that there was never a firm religious boundary between Hindus and Sikhs. And that has always been the source of anxiety for Sikhs, or some Sikhs. Because if there's no firm religious boundary, it means that you can relapse back into the condition of being a Hindu. Right? I mean, that's the scenario that I'm setting up, and that's why we had to go back really to the 15th century. So that's one part of the narrative. Now the second part of the narrative is contemporary politics. 
And there I raised a number of questions for you, right? So for example, you know, you remember the discussion we have had uh, on the Green Revolution. And one of the, so the Punjab becomes the breadbasket of India. That's what it's called, the breadbasket of India. Because the Green Revolution in particular took off in the Punjab, which was always a farming kind of territory, if, or terrain, if I may put it this way. Right? Enterprising farmers and so on. I mean, the British used to write about the Punjabis as a very enterprising, you know, um, uh, farming people. Okay? And so it takes off there for reasons that I'm not going to go into now because I've already talked about them. You know, the mechanization of agriculture, new seeds, you know, fertilizers, pesticides, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what it creates is it creates a new class of extremely wealthy farmers. And it creates new forms of inequality. So that now there's going to be resentment within the Punjab, within the Sikh Punjabi community. And you know, you have to say Sikh Punjabi because there are Punjabis who are obviously Hindus as well. Right? But so within the Sikh Punjabi community, it raises resentments. Uh, and the re people who are resentful are those who have been left out, if I may put it this way, of the Green Revolution. Right? And you might recall that map I had drawn about maybe 10 days ago or something, where I was talking about all the assaults upon the center of India, right? So you got Northeast, Assam, secessionist movements, you got troubles, the, the, uh, the Dravidian uh, anti-Hindi movement in the, in the south, right? And so the Punjab I had pinpointed, and we said we would discuss it in greater detail, which is what we're doing now. But what we're saying is that from the 1970s, what you have is you begin to have if I may put it this way, a kind of an assault upon the center. It looks like the center is kind of disintegrating in some way. Okay, so you have, a, you have this secessionist movement. Now they have very particular demands. We haven't really looked at the demands in detail. We've looked at one of them, obviously, and that is a demand for autonomy. But even there, remember that I made a distinction between autonomy within India, greater autonomy within India, and then of course, the other form of that the, uh, of that particular demand is, well, not just autonomy within India, but the creation of a nation, separate nation state. That's the secessionist movement, right? Um, and, they, and the demand, uh, demand is going to be encompassed uh, of, uh, uh, in the demand for a state which is going to be called Khalistan. That's what they want to call it, right? Uh, and as in the Sri Lankan case, which we're going to look at very shortly, one of the important things here is the relationship of this movement to the diaspora. Because this Khalistan movement, okay, um, and I want to be very clear what my view here is. I, I'm not saying that this movement was driven by people living overseas, no. I think that whenever you have a movement of this sort, there is always a homegrown movement here, okay? That there are people who have grievances, legitimate or otherwise. We haven't assessed whether those grievances are legitimate. Right? But it's a homegrown movement. I think the, the impulse of the Indian state or any state in this situation is always to say, ah, this is being done by people, agitators living outside. You know? There's no real dissent here. And I think that that's entirely incorrect. But on the other hand, it's very clear that, that there is substantial support for the Khalistan movement okay, overseas, as there is very substantial support for the Tamilians in Sri Lanka among the Tamilian Sri Lankan diaspora living overseas. Okay, the comparable cases in that sense. And in fact, the Khalistan movement, one of its headquarters was California. California, as I pointed out before, you know, right? I mean, in fact, uh, they set up a government in exile, that set up in London, but many of his supporters are rich, you know, Punjabis who came here a hundred years ago. I mean, they weren't rich then, but they became rich. You know, some of the biggest farmers, I don't know if you know that, but for example, the biggest peach farmer in the world is a Punjabi, you know, living in California, okay? Now, I'm not saying that he is a supporter or, but I'm, what I am saying is that there, there's support coming from places like the United Kingdom and the United States, okay, for this secessionist movement, okay? So what were the demands? Well, apart from the demand for autonomy, let me give you another il illustration of another kind of demand that came up. So you remember the five Ks, okay? And I would mentioned to you Kish. Kish is the here. Because this is related to the question, well, how do you actually distinguish a Sikh from a Hindu, right? I mean, uh, you say, yeah, theologically there may be ways to distinguish, but externally, how do you actually distinguish? Uh, if, if the Sikh decides 
to remove all the external appearances of being a Sikh, such as wearing a turban, uh, having long you know, hair, a beard, so forth and so on. Well, you really can't. There's really no way to distinguish. Okay? Right? Um, and some people say, oh, you can distinguish a Sikh because some of you would know that many of the Sikh males, their last name is Singh. Okay? But in fact, Rajput Hindus have that last name too. Okay? So you can't really go by that either. Right? Uh, the word Singh here means lion. Okay? Right? So you can't go by that either. And the question was, all right, so if you think about the five Ks now, so one of the Ks that I didn't mention to you is the Kirpan. This is a complicated word because if you translate it, it translates at, as, you know, a sword or a dagger. Okay? And it could be this, this big or it could be two inches. And it could be sewn into your clothes or it could be, as I said, a flashing sword. They're both a Kirpan. Okay? And I, we won't get into the semiotics of the Kirpan, I, the, a, a long narrative about the Kirpan itself. Okay? But the point is, what is the demand? Well, how is it related to the Kirpan? So the Khalistanis, as I'm going to call them now, that is the ones who are the most aggressively making a demand, they said, the Kirpan is to the Sikh what a cross is to a Christian. So when a Sikh male boards an Indian Airlines plane, he should be allowed to carry a kirpan. And the Indian government said, out of the question, impossible, that's a weapon. You can't carry a weapon on a plane. The international regulations, security, etc., etc. Well, and the Sikh, the Khalasani said, yeah, but it's not a weapon. You're calling it a weapon. It's a kirpan. Okay? It's a kirpan. And it's not meant to be used for offensive purposes. Right? And so, of course, the Indian government lawyer is going to say, yeah, but what if it is? Who's going to be held accountable, right? If you can use it in principle, then it is a weapon. Now, in, in, the, in the courts of California, by the way, this issue is going to come up. In the courts of California. Because, and you can see how these issues are all related to the diaspora. You might think, why the hell would any court in California bring up this matter? Because there were Sikh children in California schools who were carrying the kirpan. And the school code in the California says you cannot carry a weapon. So this become a lawsuit. I wrote a 40-page article on this. You know, I know the inside details of what happened here. Okay, and the lawyer for this uh, family whose children were being barred from school because the superintendent called the children's parents and said, well, your children are carrying a kirpan, and that's against state law and against the school code. Uh, and the parents said, well, it's not a sword, it's a kirpan. And this school superintendent, of course, you know, said, well, you know, I don't know what all this kirpan business is. It looks like a weapon to me. And either your children keep it at home or they don't come to school. And the parents said, we're not going to send our children to school. So they hired the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, right? Because they said, our freedom of religious expression has been violated. Right? Now, we won't go through the details, but here's the interesting detail. If you're going to call it a weapon, because the government, the government said, well, it can be used as a weapon, so the ACLU lawyer, in this case, says, well, you know, isn't it true that baseball bats are allowed in school? And uh, the lawyer for the state said, well, of course they are. You know, kids play baseball. And, you know, the AC lawyer, ACLU lawyer said, well, you know, if I take a baseball bat and I crack it on your head, I can probably kill you. So shouldn't we ban a baseball bat? And he said, yeah, but it's not a weapon. It's a baseball bat. He said, I, that's exactly what I'm saying. This is not a weapon. It's a kirpan. Okay? <laughs> right? So then you get into a whole discussion about what is the nature of an object? Does an object have intrinsic qualities? You see, right? You see, these debates can get very, very complex. I mean, it depends on how you really view it. So now they're saying, okay, the Khalistanis are saying, we should be allowed to carry a kirpan. The Indian government said nothing doing. So the Khalistanis said, well, this is an instance of how Sikhs are being discriminated against in India. Okay? And, that, and, and by the way, I mean, this is just one illustration. Now, that doesn't mean that, and you might say, well, here it's very clear. I mean, most of you might privately come to the conclusion, if not all of you, well, we really have to take the government view here, you know. Okay, I suspect that most people privately will come to that conclusion. But, of course, some of the demands are less subject to interpretation. 
okay, uh, as opposed to this one. So, you know, there's a, there's a demand. You know, one of the things that the Indian government wanted to do was it wanted to reduce the percentage of Sikhs employed in the Indian military. Now, you might say, well, that sounds like discrimination. No, because even though Sikhs are actually 2.5% of the population of India, what percentage of the Indian army were they? 20%. Right? 20%. And this has a very old history too. Why? Because the Sikhs are supposed to be more militant, more masculine. This is an old colonial ideology going back to the 19th century. Right? right? And so the Indian government said, well, you know, we need to re reduce the proportion of Sikhs in the Indian military. Right? Uh, they're not saying we're going to reduce it to your, proportionate to your population, share of the population, because that would mean an enormous cut. Right? Well, the Sikhs said, well, yeah, this is a form of discrimination. Why are, we, why are we being forcibly removed now from military jobs? Okay, and so forth and so on. There are lots of grievances. I mean, they submit a memorandum and it's got dozens of grievances listed. We can't obviously look at all of them. The point now is that I think it's very clear. There's a demand, set of demands. The set of demands amount to the fact saying that Sikhs in India have distinctly second class status. That's what it really amounts to, if you ask me, if I had to put it in you know, plain English. Um, I don't actually agree that, that they had second class status. I don't think they've ever had second class status in India. But yes, there's no question that it's a different religious entity and therefore they feel that in some cases their entitlements that they deserve are not being given to them. right? Uh, and, you know, there is also a kind of, there was no demand, for example, because how do you implement a demand of that kind? Let me put it to you this way. I mean, in, in middle class Indian society, you know, the Sikhs uh, are the brunt of jokes in the way in which the Poles were here for a long period of time. Okay? You know, how many Poles does it take to put on a light bulb kind of joke, you know? A untold number of jokes about Sikhs of that kind. Now, you can't put down demand number 56. Please request all the citizens of India that they should not make jokes about Sikhs. Right? So, you see, there are unstated grievances. There's a sentiment, and there I think you have to agree, that there is a sentiment that, you know, that they're, they're sort of viewed in a peculiar way. But the Sikhs occupy an ex extraordinary place in Indian society because, yeah, I mean, they're in the military, but everybody recognizes them as extraordinarily generous, which I think is absolutely true. A very, very generous people, for example, okay? Right? So now what's going to happen, and you have to now think back of all the elements in the narrative that I've already mentioned to you, so in the late 1970s, the, the demand is going to accelerate for a separate state. Okay? And that doesn't mean, by the way, that all of the Sikhs who view the Indian state as oppressive, that all of them are in favor of the demand for secession. The major, the, or, or I should say the most well-known exponent of the demand is going to become, is a man whose name is Bindranwale. Okay? He's the most well-known advocate of the view that there, that there should be a separate state, although even he is, by the way, ambivalent at times, you know. Right? And he's ambivalent at times partly because he recognizes the close proximity of Hindus to Sikhs. Even he does, even though at other times he wants to say that these are two completely separate religions. We don't want to have anything to do with the Hindus. They're a bunch of effeminate people. I mean, he'll say that openly in speeches. They're womanly. There are no men in the Hindu community, he would say, you know, loudly, right? Okay? So, so, but he's ambivalent about these things. I mean, if I quoted speeches to you, you will see that ambivalence coming through, you know, all the time, right? So now, in the early 1980s, there is a campaign of terror that's going to take place on both sides. Because some of these secessionists are going to start take to arms. They're going to say, well, we have to force the hand of the government. You know, we've got these demands. These demands have to be met. Okay? And this is where my reading is very different than the kind of reading that used to be done. Because I'm suggesting to you that the demand, yes, there are demands against the Indian state. But if you look at the people who were targeted, the people who were killed in political, acts of political assassination, and in Delhi in the 19, early 1980s meant that there were things like bombs being placed on buses, 
on buses, crowded buses, you know. I mean, we've gone through that in India for a long time now. You know, the kinds of things you hear about today about terrorist attacks, you know, uh, so forth and so on. Right? So, uh, and when I say it's two-pronged, on the one hand, you've got the secessionists, militant secessionists, they're waging a campaign, but they're waging it not only against Hindus and Hindu intellectuals who took a very strong view of this and said, well, these people should be put down, right? They certainly are, the, the, the secession and militant secessionists are going to target these Hindu intellectuals, no doubt about it, okay? They were also targeting members of their own community. Why? Because they targeted moderate Sikhs such as Mona Sikhs. Remember Mona Sikhs are the Sikhs who cut their hair. Because they're saying to them, you are betraying the Sikh faith. You are betraying the Sikh faith. But is, is it really a betrayal? Because there's a tussle within the Sikh faith about what does it mean to be a Sikh? So if you take off your hair, right? If you have a haircut and you trim your beard, take it off, do you cease to be a Sikh? And of course, the Sikhs are saying, you know, that's absurd. That should not be the way in which you define a Sikh. But there's this problem. How do you define a Sikh? Right? So if you actually look at who's being targeted, it's not just Hindu intellectuals and journalists. There are moderate Sikhs who are being targeted by the orthodox Sikhs. This is going to become a major issue. And so what I'm saying is that what appears to be a Hindu-Muslim, uh, Hindu-Sikh conflict, a conflict between a Sikh minority and what they perceived as a largely Hindu-dominated state, okay? Now, there are elements of that which may be true, but what is perceived to be that is also, in fact, actually a conflict within the Sikh community about the future of the Sikh community, about defining who is a Sikh, okay? And to bring the narrative to a rapid conclusion now, right, this whole process of assassination terror is going to continue. Now, when a secessionist movement engages in that, it's a green light for the state to go ahead and retaliate in the same way. And this is always a problem, that the state always has you know, more arms at its disposal, a greater organization, greater powers of repression. That's what it means to be a state. You have powers of repression. You can repress, right, the aspirations of a people, whether legitimate or otherwise. And so, in fact, the state started engaging in an act of terror as well. I, th I think there's no question about it. The Indian state's view might be, oh, no, no, we were just protecting our citizens. I think there's a campaign of counter-terror. And this takes place in the rural countryside, where a large number of Sikh males are going to disappear. You know, the, the state arrives in the form of the police on the door of somebody at 2 a.m., you know, because they think, ah, oh, there are three young Sikh males here. We have heard rumors that they may be involved in the terrorist movement or the secessionist movement, and they'll just take them away. Thousands of men disappear. They do. You know. I mean, and, and you know, if you tell the Indian state that, they'll say, oh, this is a concoction of... Amnesty and Human Rights Watch. These, you know, Western organizations are the ones who are saying that kind of thing. That's not at all the case. Sure, Amnesty was saying that, Human Rights Watch was saying that, but there are Indian civil rights groups that are saying that, you know, because India has a tradition of civil rights groups. We don't need Amnesty to tell us that this is happening here. I mean, Indian civil rights groups are saying it, right, that you have a campaign of terror going on on both sides now. And so these secessionists led by Bhindran Wale, they in 1982, they are going to basically take refuge, some of them, inside the Golden Temple, which is the most sacred shrine of the Sikh faith in the city of Amritsar. Now, this is a real problem because you're not supposed to use, you know, a Gurdwara. So, uh, the, the Sikh place of worship is called Gurdwara from the word Guru plus Dwara, so the door to the Guru, right? Remember the veneration given to the guru in the Sikh faith, as I explained last time, right? So they hold up in a, a building within the Golden Temple complex. It's a huge, sprawling complex. The temple goes back 400 years. Magnificent piece of architecture. Now, and the problem is that you can't have the state go in because then you are violating the religious sanctity of that place, right? And so this was a clever move on the part of Bindran Wale. But eventually the state had to do exactly that. Right? So in 1983, by the way, Bindran Wale is going to move into the main building of the Golden Temple. Right? And he's going to set up machine guns and fortifications and sandbags. I mean, this has become a fortress, literally. You know? And so in 1984, in June of 1984, in fact, I was in Delhi that summer, 
So every, you know, you're watching the news, he hearing what's going on. In June 1984, the Indian government is going to launch an operation called Operation Blue Star, okay, to liberate the temple and to flush out the terrorists, right? And they move in with the army. And the building is going to be damaged somewhat. Of course, that's going to become another huge furor over that because the sanctity of this place has been violated. Bindran Wale is going to be killed, right? In this encounter, as it's called, okay? But that doesn't end the whole chapter. In fact, Sikh secessionism is going to continue through the 80s, and it's only in the early 1990s, partly because they're simply worn down by the state, partly. Some people say that the Indian government made some concessions, right? But partly, you cannot simply fight the state continuously in most of these cases. And the enthusiasm for many of these things over a period of time, one of the ways in which you wear down people and wear down a movement is the war of attrition, right? You just drag it out, drag it out. Eventually, people get exhausted with conflict as well. So in part, it was that. Partly, it was some accommodations made by the Indian state. Now, there were consequences. And I'm going to just end with one last set of consequences. So the prime minister who had ordered this Operation Blue Star was Mrs. Indira Gandhi, right? And Mrs. Indira Gandhi was told by her security team that you must not have any Sikh bodyguards because they're really infuriated, the Sikh community, about what's been done to the Golden Temple. And she said, and this is interesting, this is the same woman who imposed an emergency, remember? So she had this authoritarian strand in her. And this is where I think India always shows you a kind of a complexity, you know. So she says, well, you know, I have nothing to fear from the Sikhs, you know. I have nothing to fear. I'm the leader of a secular nation. Uh, if I succumb to the advice of my advisors and remove my Sikh bodyguards, okay, then it will be a clear sign of religious discrimination in a way. You know? So she persisted, and she's going to be shot dead by her Sikh bodyguards. Okay? She's going to be shot dead by them, and then you're going to have this anti-Sikh pogrom that's going to take place. I mean, the city of Delhi just erupted in violence when she was shot dead. I mean, within 12 hours, Sikhs were being dragged out of their homes in Delhi and being burnt alive on the streets. Okay? 1984, right? And down to the present day, down to the present day, virtually nobody has been convicted of the killings. Over 2,000 people were killed. Over 2,000 Sikhs were killed, right? The, the assassins, of course, are going to be executed. You know, they're going to be tried and they're going to be... Uh, India has capital punishment. It's exercised very infrequently, very infrequently. But here was a case where the state said capital punishment and nothing else. Okay, so that's, I think, enough of that narrative, you know? Okay, uh, and then, as I said, we're going, you know, we, we want to try to understand. So the implications, which I've already talked to you about, the direct implications, that is obviously the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi and all that. But the real implications have to do with, well, how does the state really deal with secessionist movements, with its minorities, right? And now for a moment, let's turn to the case of Sri Lanka. So expand our horizon beyond India, move. Uh, and here uh, there, is, there are obviously connections uh, with India as well. So here you have, you know, this little island, Sri Lanka, in the news every day nowadays, okay? And very briefly, let's understand the nature of the conflict here. So you have two major ethnic groups, the Sinhalese, okay, and the Tamilians. The Sinhalese, uh, who speak Sinhala, okay, and this is an Indo-Aryan language. So it's related to languages such as Hindi, Sanskrit, Gujarati, and so on, right? And then you have the Tamilians. The Tamilians, by the way, uh, 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 there are two kinds of Tamilians. Uh, so Tamilians are people who are from the state of Tamil Nadu in India. Right? The distance between the tip of this and Sri Lanka is just, you know, 30, 40 kilometers, something like that. I mean, it's very short, okay? So these Tamilians are of two kinds. You, you can distinguish between what are called the Sri Lankan Tamilians or Tamils and the Indian Tamils. Now, all Tamils come from India, but the distinction is basically the following. The Sri Lankan Tamils are Tamils who have been in Sri Lanka for centuries, literally centuries, okay? Because you have, in fact, 
Sri Lanka, I mean, the predominant population would have been all Tamils, right? In the migration of these people a long time ago. The old Jaffna kingdom here was basically a Tamil kingdom, all right? So these are people who are much more integrated because they've been around for a long time in Sri Lankan society, all right? Then you have the Indian Tamils who, whose origins in Sri Lanka are basically 19th century, 19th century. Why? Because what kind of plantations do they have? Anybody? No tea drinkers here, huh? <laughs> tea, tea. Right? I mean, tea comes, you know, the best tea comes from India and Sri Lanka. Right? Big tea plantations. So, and this is manual labor, picking the tea leaves off, you know, right? So where do they get their labor from? From India, right? Indi India is a British colony, don't forget. Sri Lanka is a British colony. So Sri Lanka is one of many places, by the way, that the Indians were taken to to work as laborers, right? They were taken to, I think I've mentioned that to you before, Fiji, Mauritius, Guyana, Suriname, South Africa, Malaysia, you name it, right? Huge populations. So these Indian Tamils are people who are basically of 19th century origin, okay? In, that is in, within the history of Sri Lanka. Much less integrated, if I may put it this way, okay? And their concentration is really roughly around here, in sort of central, south central, Okay, then you have, the, the Tamils are basically in three places. You have Tamils over here on the east, here, and then Tamils in the north, over here. The Tamils here are more like Sri Lankan Tamils, or the older Tamils. Uh, these ones have, are more patrilineal, these ones are more matrilineal. You can get into a real ethnography of who these people are. And these are, on the other hand, people who come really from the 19th century, right? Okay, now, uh, in Sri Lanka, in the 1940s, after independence, the, the Sinhalese were numerically dominant, predominant. In 1956, two pieces of legislation are passed. I'm giving you two illustrations. We could, we could look at a lot of other pieces of legislation, but these two will be sufficient to make the point. One is a piece of legislation which, is, which you might describe as Sinhala-only legislation, namely that the Sri Lankan state decided that the only official language of Sri Lanka would be Sinhalese. Now the Tamils, of course, got <coughs> furious, upset, because that's not their language. Their language is Tamil. And they're not, you know, a minuscule portion of the population. They're a pretty significant portion of the population you're talking about. And the second was a piece of legislation which said that teacher training colleges would only be open to Sinhalese. A clear act of discrimination. I mean, I think there's no question that if you look at Sri Lanka, the Tamils have a legitimate ground for claiming that they have been treated as second-class citizens. At least the Indian Tamils. I'm not really speaking about the Sri Lankan Tamils so much, the Indian Tamils. And, you heard, and these people were there in very large numbers. In 1960s, the Indian government and Sri Lankan government came to an agreement. So it's a repatriation agreement. The agreement was that 40% roughly of the Indian Tamils would be given Sri Lankan citizenship. The remaining would be sent back to India. The Indian government agreed. Now that's a very interesting illustration of where the Indian government basically couldn't really do much because it might like to think of itself as a great ancient civilization, all of that, but being an ancient civilization and having great text doesn't translate into muscle power. It doesn't. And this is something that they recognize. The, the diaspora connection here is going to become important too, because elsewhere in the world, right, and this is a point, a place to mention it, because we won't really be able to look at the contemporary history of India in relationship to its diaspora, which is a very interesting subject. But uh, there are countries from which Indians are going to be thrown out, okay? And the most visible example of that is going to be Uganda, okay, in the late 1960s, where all the Indians are going to be expelled. Right? And when, of course, they expelled the Indians, they found that within five years, the economy of Uganda had absolutely collapsed because the Indians were the ones who had all the trading networks. All the teachers, all the professionals were all Indians. And, you know, you expel the Indians and, you know, it's like expelling the Indians from Silicon Valley today. I mean, you run into quite a few problems, okay? 
Right? So this is what we're really speaking about over here, that there is a connection, that there's this question that India really is not able to do much. It, has, it agrees to this repatriation agreement. The idea of this repatriation agreement was, well, maybe this will solve the problem. Because by this time, there's already simmering discontent, right? I mean, this is after that 1956 pieces of legislation that I mentioned to you. Right? So there's simmering discontent among the Tamilians. The Sri Lankan state obviously does not want a war on its hands. That is what it's going to get. Because the repatriation agreement, even though it meant that, okay, at least 40% of them get Sri Lankan citizenship, but that doesn't resolve many of the other problems that we're talking about, such as the Sinhala only. You know, or discrimination in jobs, because you can tell from the name immediately whether the person is Sri Lankan, a Sinhalese, or Tamil. Immediately you can tell, right? Okay. So what we're going to have is we're going to have the development of a guerrilla war, and and an organization is eventually going to come into place, called the the uh, LTTE. Okay, uh, Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam. Elam means state. Okay. Uh, this is, I mean, I mentioned that before and now I will repeat it. This is without a shadow of a doubt, in my view, okay, the most innovative guerrilla group in the world. Okay, I mean, the, the way they managed the insurrection, insurgency, okay, with their numbers, I mean, they pioneered everything from suicide bombing to recruiting children, okay, young 10, 12 year old boys uh, to the use of women as infiltrators, uh, you know, to the use of the internet to create massive funds, right? For example, using the internet to, to get funds from people living in the diaspora, right? Sri Lankan Tamils, Tamils from Sri Lanka now living in Australia, places like that, where there's significant populations, and many European countries, there's significant populations of Sri Lankans, right? And they're mainly Tamilians. You know, people who have migrated because they think that they're not going to get a fair deal, obviously, in Sri Lanka, right? So these are people who supported the movement. And the Tamil Tigers, their leader is this man who's hardly ever seen. You know, his name is Prabhakaran, okay? And, and this is where the news comes in now that, you know, that basically, I mean, this war has been going on for 25 years. Estimated casualties, 75 to 85,000 people, okay, over the 25 years. Um, and what we are saying is that now it seems, it seems that the Tamil Tigers are going to be wiped out. Okay, uh, they've been cornered, uh, they've lost most of their force. Uh, but these are the pe same people who two years ago in two aircraft actually waged a bomb attack on Colombo, right? I mean, they have their own air force, they have their own naval force, right? E extraordinary. I mean, this little guerrilla group absolutely extraordinary how they've really worked over the years. Okay, so we don't know what the outcome is. Uh, they're supposed to be a, about 50,000 to 100,000 civilians. That's where the problem is. Because you could say, why isn't, the, why isn't the state gone in for the kill, right? But the state is saying that the Tamil Tigers are using these 50,000, 100,000 civilians who are caught in that little zone, okay, where the Tamil Tigers have been trapped, that they're using them as human shields, right? So this is where the, what the situation is as of the present moment. Okay? Now you have, in effect, a similar problem. Um, and here we are not making a relative assessment of whether the Tamil demands in Sri Lanka are less or more convincing than the demands of the Sikhs in India. Okay? There are other secessionist movements as well that we could have looked at, but we're looking at two illustrations uh, because we have a similar set of problems in many ways. The question of language is important. I didn't talk to you about that in the case of the Sikhs, but that's important because uh, the language of the, uh, of the uh, Punjabi uh, Sikhs is, uh, in particular is Gurmukhi. Okay? Uh, uh, but you know, it, it, the question is not simply what language it is. The question is what script do you write the language in? Okay, you can write the language in different scripts. So they wanted an official script. The 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 uh, the people who are uh, making a demand for a separate state, for example, okay, or people who have you know grievances, the Sikhs who have grievances. They're saying it's not just enough to declare this as the official language of the Punjab. We have to have an official script declared as well, which is a Sikh, uh, uh, the the script more appropriate for our purposes, right? Right? And so one could go on in this way. You know, you could look at language issues, you could look at economic issues, 
And you could say, well, there are parallels, you know, between these two cases, right? But the questions are pretty much the same, right? How did the state handle it? And we saw that in both cases, it's repression, no question about it. Uh, but I think that that's a problem. When you use violence, you, in, you invite the state to use more violence in retaliation, right? And I'm also suggesting there are other interesting aspects to this, right? And just briefly suggest, suggested them. And that includes, for example, the diaspora connection. And of course, we haven't really spoken about, you know, what was the role. We did speak about it, actually, in one of my previous lectures. What was the role of the Indian state in this conflict, right? You remember I had mentioned to you on a previous occasion that the Indian government sent an Indian peacekeeping force at the request of the Sri Lankan government, right? Okay? And that backfired. And that didn't really lead to any good over there. In fact, the, the consensus of people in Sri Lanka was, this is meddling by the Indian state. Why is the Indian state meddling? And this is an internal matter, right? And so there are questions of sovereignty. When does a matter cease to be internal matter? If you've got a population in a state being eliminated by the state, well, should other sovereign countries do something or not? Or is this strictly an internal matter, right? Uh, if, if, for example, there was a feeling that there was a genocide going on in the United States against African Americans, let's say hypothetically, okay? Well, would that entitle African states to say, well, we're going to interfere, you know? The problem, of course, is that, well, what are, what are they going to do? They can't launch an attack, right? So the ability to interfere has to do with the power of a state as well. Right? And these are all kinds of questions that really came, came up in these conflicts. Okay, so I think we're going to end this segment about conflicts over, you know, religion, ethnicity, and so on, because what I want to do here is I want to move on to the question of caste. Okay, uh, and I'm not going to be able to finish what I have to say about that today. That's fine, because we're more or less on schedule, so we'll probably spend another 15, 20 minutes on that uh, on Tuesday as well. But let me begin, okay, with a few general observations. And here again, some of the material we have looked at when I was talking to you about caste reservations, if you, if you recall, right? Uh, we had a discussion about caste reservations. But we need to go back to some primary questions before we get into the question of what is the nature of caste conflict? How acute is it? What is the status of Dalits? Okay, uh, Dalits would be the lowest of the low, okay, uh, in Indian society today, right? Um, what numbers are we talking about here anyhow, right? And so on. And of course, what is the relationship? One of the key questions. What is the relationship of the official view which is enshrined in the Indian constitution that you cannot discriminate against a group of people or a community of people on the basis of their caste or religion. The Indian constitution will say that, of course, right? So what is the relationship between that official prohibition, okay, on the exercise of discrimination and how people in fact actually suffer discrimination on a day-to-day -day basis? That is, in other words, this is the question to think about. In every society, there are some forms of injustice. I think that that's quite clear. In some societies, they may be more acute. In some, they may be less acute. In some, the involvement of the state may be greater than in trying to eliminate them. And in some, there may be no involvement of the state. In fact, the involvement of the state may be in aggravating the inequalities. We've seen that as well. So the question here is that the Constitution of India says that the practice of untouchability is outlawed. It's illegal. So practice of untouchability, I have to explain what that means because some of you here will really not know what I'm talking about when I say practice of untouchability. So what the practice of untouchability means, means practice of discrimination against untouchable. What does that mean in real terms? What it means in real terms, an illustration, would be you're living in a village in North India, and there's a population of 500, and you have one single source of water, and that's a well, a big well, okay? And you don't have any other source of water. You're living in an arid area. There's no pond, no river, nothing, okay? Also, by the way, drought-stricken to some degree, let's say. Okay, I'm, I'm taking the worst-case scenario here because the well could be in any place and there could be even three wells, but we're taking the worst case scenario so that you see how bad it can really get in a way, 
right? So in that village, you have Brahmins, upper caste, and you have Dalits, lower caste, and there may be people of the middling caste, people in the middle caste. Let's say a mix of people. From time immemorial, in that village, there's no written rule ever which says that an untouchable cannot extract water from that well. No written rule that says that. But that's been the custom in that village for as long as you can remember, for as long as the elders can remember, going back generations. right? And if there was a written tradition in that village, you might think that probably you would find that that's how it's been in that village all the time. But certainly in the living memory of people, that's how it's been. Okay, You cannot extract water from that well if you are an untouchable. Why? Because if you extract water from that well, it contaminates that body of water, and the Brahmin cannot use it. Okay, So this is what it would mean. So therefore, then the custom is that untouchables cannot extract water from that village well. If they cannot, that means that they're suffering from a huge liability, right? Because water is indispensable, whether it's for cooking, cleaning yourself, any number of things, right? What do you do? And it could mean that some of the untouchables will have to walk 20 miles to the next source of water that they have access to, right? That happens, by the way. I'm not saying it happens in every village, right? So when we say the Constitution says you cannot practice untouchability, it means you cannot deny people access to that water on the grounds that they are untouchables. Of course, you can't deny them access to water on any other grounds either. Right? But here we are interested only in the problem of untouchability. That would be an illustration. Another illustration would be an untouchable boy gains, seeks admission into a school. So his father and mother take him, you know, 10-year-old boy to a school, uh, and the teachers, you know, you, by the way, you can tell usually from last names, you know, okay, what caste the person is from, okay? Um, and so the teacher says, oh, I'm not going to take, take this boy because he's an untouchable, and if I take him, every other boy and girl in that class is not going to come to class, right? Right? So that would be the practice of untouchability. The Constitution says, cannot practice it. And if you practice untouchability, so if in that village, uh, the Brahmins, just one, so let me finish my thought, if the Brahmins try to enforce it, right, they are subject to criminal prosecution. That's the law. Now, how many millions of cases do you think have been subjected to criminal prosecution? Big fat zero. Forget about millions, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, thousands, hundreds, virtually no case is ever prosecuted. Right? Virtually no case. And of course, we're not saying, as I said, that it's prevalent in every village, every town. No, but it's sufficiently prevalent enough that it's a problem. So now we say this is what it means for the state to have outlawed untouchability. And so the question that's going to be prominent for us that we have to weigh in our minds is, what is the way in which one works towards the elimination of these grievances? Because clearly, the prohibition by the state is not sufficient. But that doesn't mean that the state should not prohibit it. I'm not making an argument for saying that the state should not prohibit it. But clearly, the state's prohibiting it is not sufficient at all. Why? Because the people who should be saying to themselves, ah, you know, what I'm doing is wrong. I'm, pre I'm preventing somebody from getting water, you know, and this person has equal rights to this water as I do. That person has not been convinced in his heart and mind that the abolition of untouchability is a desirable thing, right? And this is what Gandhi meant in 1922 in a famous speech he made when he was put on trial by the British. He said, affection cannot I'm using his exact words. Affection cannot be manufactured by the law. Affection. You cannot make people love other people because the law tells you that you have to love them. You cannot make people simply say, okay, I'm going to change my attitude about this because the law is telling me to do it. In fact, the law telling you to do it might harden your feelings about 
continuing with that practice. Right? So this is going to become the grounds for a big debate, as we're going to see. And next Tuesday, right, uh, between two major people in the 20th century about how one goes about practice abolishing untouchability. Okay. Now, uh, there's a question over here. Yeah. No, 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 no. The OBCs are different. Okay. So the, the untouchables are, are the same as the Dalits. They're, they're different words that are used for them at different times. So in the 1920s, 1930s, um, there are basically three words that are used. Okay, one is untouchables, and you know the word untouchable itself. I mean, it's a pretty grim word, right? Uh, untouchable. I mean, it's quite literal, you know, uh, because if a Brahmin touches an untouchable, he gets contaminated. Then he has to go and undertake various rituals to get purified. Okay, all right. Um, that's one word that's used. Second word that is used is the depressed classes. Now, in English, that doesn't sound much better either. Depressed, I mean, this is not, you know, depressed and you need, you know, a whole load of medicine there to lift up your spirits. Depressed here means economically depressed, right? But depressed, you know, in English really does have, as I said, all other kinds of connotations. So that word was dropped. And then the word that was used in the post-47 period um, was SC, as you might remember, and ST. These are acronyms, scheduled castes and scheduled, scheduled, you know, as in the word schedule, you know, what is a, a railway schedule, okay? Schedule, D-U-L-E here, okay, right? Ske you know, that is that they're listed. Who, who are the untouchables? Well, you know, what communities form the untouchables or, you know, the lowest of the low? So a appendix is going to list them, okay? And that's a schedule to the constitution, really, in a way, okay? So they're listed and then scheduled tribes. Right? Now, Gandhi had a word for them. He, he came up with a new word. Uh, that became very controversial. He called them Harijans. Okay, he called them Harijans, and Harijans means children of God. Because he wanted to indicate that, you know, they are literally children of God just like anybody else. Right? Of course, the Dalits particularly, you know, some of the leaders of the Dalits from the late 1920s found that to be condescending. Right? And so there was a big dispute about, you know, whether we should even use that word or not. But Gandhi had started using it. But Gandhi started using something, it fell into place for a long time. And it's really only until, it's only in the 1940s, 50s that the word Harijan began to disappear from the vocabulary. The word Dalits then comes into place. So the Dalits is a word from Marathi, the word Dalit. Um, and several different meanings, but basically uh, Dalits are those who rebel, radical, okay? Right? In fact, the Dalit, the leaders of the Dalit uh, created an organization called the Dalit Panthers. Does it sound, does anybody know an American history? You know, right? The, right? Black Panthers, right? So the Dalit Panthers, the most radical of them constituted themselves into a group called the Dalit Panthers. That's a much later segment of that history. We're going to get to that a little bit later on, OK? Um, but the question here was OBCs. So yes, you have Dalits are the lowest, known by different names. And then OBCs is a much more recent category. OBCs means other backward classes, OK? And so OBCs are people who are above that. The cat, they're, they're, this is, I mean, you know, if we were doing the anthropology so of India, you know, we'd, we'd look at all of this in much greater detail. But uh, the, the OBC, there's a category that you, fam word that you should be familiar with. It's called Shudras, OK? So let's now go back to the basics for a moment. So here you have four castes. Um, but this is really the textbook view, OK? And when I say the four castes, what I'm referring to here is, OK, very quickly, um, Brahmins. So these are the upper castes, right? And who are the Brahmins? They're the priests, the clergy, if you want to put it this way. Uh, I mean, these are all Western terms, priests, clergy. Sounds too much like Christians, you know, frankly. Yeah. Oh, well, you see, for example, all the major rituals. So for example, when a child is born and you have a namkaran, namkaran is a naming ceremony. So who do you invite? You invite a priest or a pandit. The word would be used, pandit. So who are the pandits? They're Brahmins. So basically, people who preside over religious 
uh, rituals, religious festivals. Uh, the people who, historically speaking, would have been responsible for the transmission of sacred knowledge from one generation to another. Okay, right? So they're you, they're also the learned ones, if I may put it this way. Okay. Um, the word Brahmins enters into the English language. I mean, for those of you who know the literary history of the United States on the East Coast, there used to be a group of people a hundred years ago called the Boston Brahmins. You know, okay? So this refers to, you know, New England aristocratic elite, intellectual elite. They're called the Boston Brahmins, okay? So you've got Brahmins and then you've got the Kshatriyas, uh, which is the second caste group, okay? This is all very provisional and you'll see why in just a moment. Um, Kshatriyas are the warriors, traditionally, okay? Uh, but again, that's not a very intelligible category today. Warriors, I mean, you know, are there warriors anymore? They're soldiers, right? Uh, but warriors, I mean, that sounds like, you know, some other era or age, right? Um, and so, but traditionally, they, they, that's what they would have done. They would also have been the administrative elite. And one way to understand the relationship between the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas is the Brahmins wield spiritual power and the Kshatriyas wield Temporal power, real, material power. They complement each other, right? They complement each other. So these are the two top castes. And then you have the Vaishyas, the middling castes, right? And Vaishyas would be people who are shopkeepers, entrepreneurs, merchants, businessmen, you know, that kind of thing. And then you have the Shudras, okay? They were no, according to the older Indian books, which delineate these, okay? There are no Dalits who are untouchable back then. You have these four castes. Now this is what you have to recognize as the textbook view, I'm calling it, the textbook view. That is, the textbooks tell you, and when I refer to a textbook, what do I mean? Let me give you an illustration, a book called Manu Smriti, okay? Manu Smriti is a work that dates back to the second century AD. Okay, so about roughly 2,000 years old. Uh, Manu Sriti means in English the laws of Manu. Who is Manu? Manu is like a lawgiver, like Moses, if I may put it this way. The ancient lawgiver. Okay, so the Manu Sriti delineates these four castes. Okay, but in effect, of course, in Indian society, what you have is thousands of sub castes. Thousands of sub castes. Okay, you know, these, this is simply a kind of an overarching view. Okay. It's not going to tell you what is the relationship between people on an everyday level, even with respect to caste. But there are some things that are true, even in the textbook view, such as the fact that the Shudras were at the very bottom, okay? And the, these three castes are called the twice-born caste or the uh, upper caste. Redemption is possible for them. For the Shudras, redemption is not possible. Redemption, again, is a problem because of the Christian category, you know, so we're not, these are not people who are Christians and we can't really use Christian theology, but for the sake of convenience, I'm putting it to you this way, okay? So this is, and there's a division of labor, right? So priests, pundits, scholars, if you want to put it this way, kshatriyas, warriors, administrative elite, ru rulers, rulers, right? And the Vaishyas, basically the people who do a lot of the work that shopkeepers, traders, merchantmen, business, you know, right? And then the shudras and farmers as well, some farmers, shudras, people who do the menial labor, menial work, manual work, right? Cleaning the streets, picking up garbage, all kinds of things, right? Uh, but but, but even, even a barber, for example, would be most of the nais would fall in the shudra category, okay? Right? So this is the textbook view. And I said some elements of that are true. For example, right, uh, what is the likelihood of a marriage between a Brahmin and a Shudra? Very, very low. Even the most progressive Indians today, middle class Indians, when it gets to marriage, you know, you might be a leftist and all of that, Marxist, you name it, every radical theology that you can think of. But when it comes to marriage, uh, you get an astrologer and then, you know, you compare the charts and all of that. And of course, if the person is a Shudra and you're a Brahmin, well, forget it, you know. Now, there are exceptions, right? What are the exceptions? A Shudra woman can marry a Brahmin man. Why? The reverse is never true. 
No, but I mean, to take care of the house, but any woman would take care of the house, I mean, in that scheme of things, right? But I'm saying that it's, I mean, it's not like the most desirable marriage in the world for a Shudra woman. That is according to this view, right? For a Shudra woman to marry a Brahmin man. But she can do so without violating the norms of society. Simple reason. Because in that kind of society, as in the United States, the woman acquires upon marriage the status of the man she is marrying. Her children with this Brahmin man, man are going to be Brahmins. But if a Brahmin woman marries a Shudra male, you got trouble. Right? Because the Brahmin woman, right, marrying a Shudra male, that means that her children will acquire the status of her husband, or should they become shudras? Nobody's going to do that, you know? I mean, women always marry upwards in every society I can think of. Because generally, in every society, that's been the norm, that the women acquire the status, and I'm just talking about the name. They acquire, the, the children acquire the status of her husband. Right? So who are the Dalits now? Lots of theories. Untouchables, because the untouchables are not mentioned in this scheme of things. So one theory is the untouchables were, for example, the offspring. Or as they say in Indian English, I bet you've never heard that word before, most of you, issue. You know, issue means child, by the way. You know, how many issue do you have? <laughs> okay, it's not how many issues you have. Oh, I've got political and psychological issues. You know, when they say, how many issue do you have, sir? I mean, I have two issue, yeah? You know? I have two children. Okay, so the issue here is the issue are, according to this theory, right, the issue or offspring of these marriages, that is a Brahmin woman marrying a Shudra male, right, that's the untouchables. One theory, there are many theories, I'm just, we don't have time to look at all the theories about who are the untouchables, you know, where did they come from, because if they're not in the older texts in the older scriptures, then you have to have a sociological account of who they are, where they came from. When did this category come into place? Okay, I mean some people have argued with the coming of Islam, because then it's, for example, people who are Hindus marrying Muslims, particularly upper caste Hindus marrying Muslims, that their children would be rejected by society and became known as the untouchables. Right, that's another theory, there lots of theories, yeah, Natalie. Yeah, I mean, right now the Dalits would be somewhere around 200 million. Does Buffalo say there was a lot of things going on? It could be. It could also be that they had more children. All kinds of things are possible. Yeah, all kinds of things are possible. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Uh, because, you see, once a category has been created, then you can put all kinds of people into it that you don't like. <laughs> Think of it this way. You, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that there were that many marriages, but. Everybody you want to ostracize or reject for whatever reason, over, you put them into that category and over time, there's no, no other category. Right? It, it's it's going to be a complicated you know, thing to think through exactly how their numbers multiplied and all of that. You had a question. But that's been answered now, yeah. Okay, so now, as I said, you know, they're not mentioned. The Dalits or untouchables are not mentioned. But what we are saying is there is a class of people now. And there is a constant slippage between, so now we're talking about a fifth category, right? Call them Dalits here or untouchables. But there's a constant slippage between Dalits and Shudras. When I say slippage, what I mean here is that since we really don't know enough about who are the untouchables, so to speak, well, were they Shudras? Actually, forget about the marriage. Were they just Shudras who further slipped down the ladder because, be, because among the Shudras, a pecking order was developed, right? A pecking order was developed. That is, that's the Shudras, for example, the Shudra who was the potter, who worked with pottery, or the Shudra who was a barber, said, I'm higher than a Shudra who cleans toilets. You know, because certain kinds of work is dirty, degrading, you know, 
contaminating, right? So forth and so on, right? Or for example, which group of people is responsible for the removal of uh, dead animals from the street, right? Which group of people is responsible for that, right? Because you're dealing with contaminated substances here, particularly if it happens to be a cow, let's say, right? So you, you know, what I'm saying now, I'm giving you yet another account. That is that the untouchables may not have anything to do with these, you know, illegal sort of marriages, so to speak, or marriages that were not accepted, right? Uh, or may have nothing to do with the coming of Islam. It may have to do with the fact that a pecking order developed among the Shudras as well, right? And so the ones who really fell down the ladder, so to speak, okay, became known as the fifth category, the untouchables. Yes? Very good question, but if I started to give you an answer to that, we're going to be here for another two hours, seriously, okay? Uh, because, you know, then we'd have to look at what are the different categories by which people are known, okay? So let me give you an illustration. I'll give you one illustration to suggest how one might answer that question, okay? So for example, this Hindu nationalist narrative, you know, keeps on talking about, as I've said, about the coming of the Muslim foreigners. And remember Muhammad of Ghazni, you know, the one who did all these raids, all of that, okay? Now the interesting thing is that from the point of view of the Hindu nationalists, they are all today recognized as Muslims. But the text of the 12th century does not refer to them as Muslims at all. Religion was not the category through which they were seen. So for example, these people are referred to as Turks, 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 Turks. That's not a religious category. It is a ethnic category, right? It's not a religious category. So that would be an answer, that if you're going back to that period, your question was how, how are foreigners viewed, right? Well, it all depends. Who's viewing them, at what time, what are the words that are being used to describe them, who they are, where they're coming from. Yavanas is another word that's used for foreigners. Because the question is very important that you're asking, because the question would be, well, could one say that there were forms of xenophobia, for example? Uh, or how do you, uh, 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 you know, accommodate foreigners within the caste scheme? What, ha what happens to the English, for example? You've got a million English living in India, let's say. Well, where do they fall? You know? And, of course, they don't fall anywhere within the caste system, except that I can tell you that the English elite in India out brahmin the Brahmins. I mean, they thought they were higher than the Brahmins. They loved this in some ways because they said, hey, nice pecking order. And they're coming from England where you have a big pecking order, big pecking order. So they, they thought they were better than the Brahmins. And that's what I mean when I said they out brahmin the Brahmins. You know, yeah. Do all religions follow this? Yeah. All religions. And An another complicated question. Because in principle, Muslims do not have caste in principle. But that's not how it works in India. If you're a Muslim in India, if you're a Christian in India, you more or less fall into the caste system. No question about it, right? So we then have to, we'd have to look at Muslim castes, Sikh castes, Christian castes. We're going to have to just keep that aside, you know, okay? Uh, in order to just move on. In fact, actually, we're, we're now at 12.15. So I'm going to stop the narrative here, and I'll spend another half an hour on this question, okay?